This week on Crossfeed. The physics of heaven. What's happening to church membership? Confessing the sin of being raped. How Muslim was Bin Laden. And Christians freed in Iran. Hello everyone, welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of Shepherd of the Ridge Lutheran Church in North Ridgeville, Ohio. I'm Pastor Jim Butler at St. Luke's Lutheran Church, Dedham, Massachusetts. And if you're watching this, I'm sorry you've been left behind. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, it's, it's funny, um, ever since that, uh, the, uh, you know, sort of rapture prediction thing, uh, Harold Camping, the guy that, that made the prediction, has vanished. He, nobody can find him. So apparently, nobody can find him. He was the only one raptured. <laughs> apparently, I looked up his website to see if there's any apology, anything. No, nothing there. Nothing. Nothing you new. Know, you know. Janice and I we, we went to a Red Sox game Wednesday night. We were downtown and we saw one of the RVs, and I drove right by the the. I like to call it the restaurant we ate. It actually was a bar, but that's beside the point. Uh, had, had, had good bar food, though. And, uh, but they, uh, and, you know, I got to thinking, what about those guys, people? Yeah, you know, what about the people who just sold everything? There's a, a young couple who quit their job. There's a, a, a thing about a young couple that was expecting a baby. And, you know, and the kid's supposed to come like within a month. And, you know, they, they, they sold everything. Hmm. You know? Oh, that's not right. No. You know, what are these people going to do? And, and here's the, I mean, and yeah, I heard about people that went on vacations, uh, and, you know, bought big expensive cars and stuff like that. And, um, I, I heard about, or I, I saw an article that was talking about it and they said that, um, camping's, uh, church ministry, whatever you want to call it, his radio ministry. Um, they, they had already filed for an extension on their, um, taxes till July. Then they got an ex- another extension till November. Now, if you thought that the world was going to come to an end, or at least you were going to be taken out of it, um, in May, why would you bother extending your, um, your tax, uh, return f- past july hey man this don't feel right my donkey senses are tingling all I'm thinking, over i mean it's like it, it it suddenly becomes insidious that it's not just some like ridiculous goofball you know uh that my my other one thoughts yeah it's 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 sad i just these people i mean i was reading about this guy you know in, on in the new york post and that you know he was in he spent one hundred and forty thousand dollars putting up billboards and signs and everything. And there he was, you know, standing there in Times Square and going, what what went wrong? What did I do wrong? Did, did I not get taken? You know, I mean, just, I, I, I guess I, I didn't feed my cat. I best get, better go home and feed my cat. I mean, just just completely stunned. Yeah, mm-hmm. so I just I just really pray for those poor people. I don't know what they're some of them how they can rebuild their lives. I mean, you know, some of them had their kids wearing you know some of these kids wearing you know Judgment Day T-shirts to school. Can you imagine what's gonna be like for them to go back to school tomorrow? Mm-hmm. I think we're in trouble. I mean, at the end, some of these people I just gotta really feel sorry for. I, I, don't know, I, and and that's the thing. It's like okay. You know, mock camping all you want. He deserves it. Um, you know, there's probably some commandment about that. But I, I mean, you know, this is, this is a horrible thing to do. I mean, especially when you consider that the scripture says no one knows the day or the hour. You know, not even the son of man. Right. Um, you know, and Luther says the greatest sin against the second commandment is false doctrine, saying that God has something God has not said. Mm-hmm. Which is exactly what he did. Right, right. So, I, 
you know, last week people, you know, reporters said, what if you're wrong? Are you going to re- give these people back their money that they've given to you for this? And, you know, no, this is this is what it says. It's not going to be wrong. I'm not wrong. It can't be wrong. I mean, it's just kind of a sad deal, really. Yeah. You but know, the thing like, is, the other thing is, he was wrong before. Right. 1994. So. And uh, so I guess, you know. I guess there is that, you know, was it, was it Lincoln who said, fool me once, shame on me, fool me twice, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. Mm-hmm. But I mean, I went to work out, the, work out at the gym on Friday and I had this one little, one of the workers up there come up to me and just, you know, anxious, worried to death. And I'm just like, it's not going to happen. Don't worry about it. He, he, he really, there's nothing, there's, he doesn't know what he's talking about, you know. And she goes, okay, I believe you because cause, cause I know you're a pastor, you know, because I've worn my, co- I've gone in my collar sometimes and changed, uh, over at the gym. And, uh, they, uh, you know, gee, they, they all like me over there too. They think, <laughs> think I'm all right. So, oh man, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Hey, I wonder if they'll find pornography in, uh, camping stuff the way they did in Laden's. <laughs> all right. I got to make some kind of connection here. Yeah. Yeah, that's a bit of a stretch, but okay. So um, this is, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you, by the time you're watching this or listening to this, um, have already heard this, but um, they, when they were going through all of Bin Laden's stuff, um, they found a stash of, of pornography. Um, and so it's a modern electronically recorded video, and it's fairly extensive. Um but one thing to note in this, that officials said they were not yet sure precisely where in the compound the pornography was discovered or who had been viewing it. Specifically, the officials said they did not know if Bin Laden himself had acquired or viewed the materials. All right. Um, but they also said that um, uh, three other U.S. officials familiar with evidence gathered during investigations of other Islamic militants said the discovery of pornography is not uncommon in such cases. If I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, didn't the, the after they in, you know check out the guys who uh, flew the planes into the World Trade Center on 9/11? Didn't they find pornography at their home at their homes? And didn't they attend go to strip clubs and stuff like that the night before? Um, yeah, that sounds familiar. All right, I, that, that's you know, yeah. So so here's the thing. I mean. I wonder. I wonder if the girls, the women, had burkas in the porn. <laughs> that wouldn't be porn anymore. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time pondering how that would be possible. But <laughs> don't know. It's, it's Are they like, wearing, wearing the headscarves? <laughs> yeah. There you go. All right, all right. I I don't really need to pollute my mind's eye with those kind of images. So, um, <laughs> what? They're, they're good Muslim women, then. <laughs> yeah, they're wearing the headscarf. Yeah, as long as your face is covered. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, but the, the thing is, what this points out, though, is that all of this, you know, we're doing this for Islam, and you know, and, and stuff like that. When when these people are involved in things that are forbidden by Islam, all right. This is not about religion. This is about, you know, power, uh, possibly politics, but mostly power. Um, it's, you know, this is sort of like a, a, a mafia don going to the Catholic Church. You know, it's just, it's, it's hypocrisy. But it, it's putting up a good front. Well, you think about the fact that, um, you know, what was part, you know, what's proof of what, of Western decadence and sin? Pornography is one of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in, in a lot of ways, it's sort of the epitome of it. It certainly now, causes just tremendous amount of um, of damage and, you know. Right. And it does. I mean, I'm not going to deny him mm-hmm. that. But, I mean, the reality, you know, he, he's... Accusing, condemning, you know, us for that sin, and it, it's sinful. And I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna deny that. But it's just kind of interesting that, that you know, the one who's out there condemning and saying what an evil people you all are, 
also come to find out is, you know, sampling the goods. Mm -hmm. No, that's not to say it doesn't happen um, in Christian circles. All right, and and we need to. Oh, be, it does. Yeah, and and I mean, um, uh, Christian pastors are, I mean, there's a big problem. Um, for a lot well, of, remember, I mean, you know, remember Jimmy Swagger used to, you know, can you know, f got caught with ladies in the evening, um, and we've had we've had our own issues of people, but mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, though, well, they may have their their, their things. They don't go around and, um, you know, kill people. Them. Yeah, kill people for it, you know. Um, but oh yeah, um, the I don't know. It'd be interesting if because I know we have some ELCA staff people out there um, watching our show, and I was wondering if any of them have have uh, any if they, they have any statistics on how many of their pastors have been known to use pornography. Um, I've heard estimates from the. Uh, through our Council of Presidents, I want to say they thought up to 30% of our pastors. Really? Yeah. Um, you know. But again, you know, it's a thing that it's not, you know, it's, it, it, I, I th and I think what it causes is the ease of getting it. Mm -hmm. You know? I mean, there's nothing, there's really even if you have things like Family Shield, uh, which, by the way, go to Open DNS Family Shield. It really is a great product, um, and it's free. And for, it's free. Yeah, it's 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 the cool the way it works. Uh, but even if you have that or some other filter things, there's ways around it. Mm -hmm. Very easy ways, and it's very difficult, I think, to keep. You know, and because of that, because it's so easy. Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of pastors get caught up in it. You know, this is and a lot of been, people get caught up in it. This is, I mean, this particular issue isn't a struggle for me, but um, but one thing that that I've been sort of uptight about is that um, we have Android phones, all right, and um, and on the iPhone, you can get uh, uh it's actually Triple X Church, um, that does a lot of sort of pornography help kind of stuff. Um, they have a browser for the iPhone. It's a, it's a Safari like browser, but when you install it, it disables Safari, and it has built in filtering. And I think it even has um like uh, accountability software where it'll like send a list of websites you visited to whoever you designate, and um and. But yeah, the fact that it it disables Safari, what you do then is you have somebody else like use the password or whatever to to lock it and they don't tell you that what the password is um but on a, on an android phone there's no way to um you know to to do any kind of filtering or anything like that i can't even um, find it. if you're using family shield and if you're using it on a a wireless network you should be able to go into your dns and change it yeah, except if you're using your phone and you're not using the Wi-Fi, you're using your your 3G or whatever. Yeah. Then and I, I've looked for settings on the phone, All right? Because I got kids with phones, you know, and um, and I, get rid I, of the kids. <laughs> <laughs> Takes care of the problem. <laughs> I've tried to find. I've tried to find just like browsers with built-in filtering, even like knowing that they could get around it. Um, uh, because the Android platform is open, it's, it's really easy to, you know, to hack around stuff. But I just want something in there so that, um, so that they can use something without accidentally stumbling onto something because this stuff, it, it hunts you down. Right. You know, it really I mean, is. And you have to deliberately avoid it. And it's, it, it does. I think you're right in saying that it hunts you down. It's, it's, Paul talks and Romans about those ways of doing evil, and it, it, it's there. And uh, yeah, it's really is a struggle for I think, you know, the 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 church and people in general. And uh, so, uh, but obviously, it was a problem for Bin Laden. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I would say um, pastors and or you know people who uh, you know think about your pastors if you're not a pastor, all right, and. Um, it's really good to put things in place to um, 
at, at least even on a um it, it, it just, sometimes you can do something about it sometimes you can't all right like i have in my office my office is set up so that number 1 um anybody walking past the office can look in on me and um and i i have windows open i have i have some blinds on my the window on my door i i keep those open um, whenever possible, the only time I ever shut those blinds is if the sun, sometimes at just the right time of day, the sun's shining right in there. Um, but it's, it's pretty rare. And, uh, but I, I try to keep that open all the time. Otherwise there's still another window, uh, that people can peek in on me. Um, just walking past. Um, I do that so that there's no question of sort of who I'm with and what I'm doing. Um, but also when, when you come to my, um, to my office and look in, um, there's a decent chance you can see over my shoulder on what's on my computer screen. Uh, at least one of them anyway. Um, and, uh, so, you know, there's, there's different things that you can do to, to set up. Um, there's also accountability software you can get for your PC. Um, you know, besides the filtering and, and the thing is, if you know that somebody's going to be, um, you know, checking up on you, then, that's gonna it's you know the idea is to keep an honest guy honest um mm -hmm. so yep. you know the people think about your your pastors and think about is there something you can do to help them i mean you don't want to go and accuse them you know <laughs> so be careful how you do it um oh but, just accuse them go for it <laughs> <laughs> but you know i mean think about what what can you do to to help them to um you know, to make sure that if, if this is something that they struggle with without, you know, they're not going to admit it to you if you ask them. Um, but, uh, you know, think about is, is there something that I can do to, um, to make sure that, you know, to sort of make it impossible for them or, or very difficult at least. Right. Or, you know, just ask, do, 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 uh, kind of more general, do you have, um, I'm going to use kind of a Catholic term here, but do you have a father confessor? Do you have a, a pastor that you, you know, can go to share your struggles with? You know, because I know a lot of pastors who are very lonely. They really are. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, it's interesting. I know a couple of guys that their father confessors are pastors of other denominations. Uh, they, you know, they just like, I don't know if I can handle a, a Lutheran, you know, another, L, another Lutheran, another LCMS guy or guy in my denomination knowing what, I, what you know, what I struggle with. You know, I um, I I have a father confessor, and I'm i you know, and, and yeah, he's real. He's my accountability person in a lot of different ways, and has been really good for me in that respect. And uh, I, uh, if, if pastors don't have that kind of person out there, they really need somebody like that. Ah, uh, well, let's see. We're in the Middle East. I I let, let's go ahead and stay in the Middle East here. Uh, I. Man, this, this article here really brought me joy. Um, that this Iranian court, court acquit, acquitted 11 Christians. Uh, which shocked the heck out of me to read this. Yeah. Yeah, isn't that's probably great news. charged with something else, but that's another story. Yeah. Um, my church recently has had an influx of Iranians. Uh, we've got one, two, three, four, five Iranians uh, now worshiping with us fairly, re fairly regularly. Two of them every Sunday. Um, and the other three, not quite every Sunday, but, but getting there. Um, and so, I mean, all of them have shared with me stories of being, um, uh, uh, persecuted one way or another for their faith, their Christian faith in Iran. Uh, matter of fact, one of them today was telling me that when she was in Iran, she, she, she never went to church on Sunday. She went to church on Friday night. Hmm. So that, you know, uh, and then Sunday you did something else. Well, so there's a group of 11 Christians out there in Iran. Now, they were um, part of the Iranian Christian Church, which is not one of Iran's traditional churches. I thought that was interesting, apparently. And the Church of Iran, that's it, the Church of Iran. Uh, and they were arrested... Uh, and charged with action against the order of the country and drinking alcohol after joining a house church meeting and taking communion wine. 
I guess they haven't heard that the Hebrew word for wine is actually grape juice. Uh, that's a slam at my Baptist brothers. Uh, anyway, so... Um, my advice to you, start drinking heavily. And the... Uh, uh, but no, the, 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 this is interesting. The judge said, you know, it. Um, they were doing a Christian act. And Article 13 of the Iranian Constitution allows Zoroastrians, Jews, and Christians to perform their religious rites and ceremonies and to act according to their ca- own canon in matters of personal affairs and religious education. This is interesting because communion has always been the mark of the church uh, from yes. early on. And and so the fact that they were arrested for that and, and they had to prove that they were Christians, it's like, do you know anything about Christianity? <laughs> Um, so th- th- I was happy about that. It says, uh, the Christian solidarity worldwide, uh, remains concerned over the fate of six other members of the church of Iran and Shiraz who are still awaiting the outcome of a consultation on their case. The six were charged with blasphemy, but hearing on their case was postponed to allow the prosecution more time to consult Iran's traditional churches on the validity of the charge. Cause they're just talking to your neighbor about Jesus is considered blasphemy. Right. You know, we 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 take ev- evangelism for granted and we go, "Oh, I could never do that." I mean, right. in Iran, they're you know, they they have to be careful how they do it. And Yeah, and then um, one pastor in the Church of Iran, Yusef Nardarkhani, is in prisoner, prison waiting for the outcome of appeal against the death sentence for apostasy, which probably would mean he used to be Muslim at one point and no longer mm-hmm. is. Yep. Um, and uh, the interesting to me thing about this is that is that the local authorities have 20 days to appeal the decision. You know, one thing about us is once somebody is declared innocent, they cannot be retried. Yeah, there's no such thing as double jeopardy. But over there, if you're declared innocent, uh, you are uh, you can be um, re. Um, uh, arrested again. Uh, that was interesting. This one struck a chord with me too because we have a, a young woman who's a member of our congregation who was here on a student visa. She just went back to Indonesia. And um, before she went back, she had a blog post on our website talking about being a Christian in Indonesia. And she asked to have that blog post taken down before she went back because it could cause problems for her. Uh, going back, she actually joined our, um, our, one of our Bible classes this morning via Skype. Mm. And, uh, and she had to borrow a phone to do it, but, uh, we've got some people that are actually looking into, uh, figuring out a way to get her a phone with an international calling plan or, or something like that so that, um, so that she can, uh, like watch our streaming and um, Skype in for Bible classes and stuff like that. So it's uh yeah, this really, I, I saw this, uh, well, this is, this is really good, but you know, at, at the same time, when you see these people being acquitted um, and they were arrested for taking communion, you know, you think, boy, what, what is it like to live as a Christian over there? Um, you know, and in so many places, especially in the Middle East, but, um, you know, the Far East and, and there's places all over the world that, uh, it's, it's a really dangerous thing. And we as, as Christians in America take it so much for granted. And, um, you know, just pray for those who are persecuted. So. Right. It's, uh, uh I, I want to spend some time working on, yeah, dealing with, with persecuted Christians this year, um, and have them you know, share a little bit about their, their story over there. But uh, I thought this really was very good news, and we do pray for our people there. Um, speaking of, well, okay, now we know that in the uh, Mideast uh, it has happened that uh, young girls have had to, have actually been uh, stoned to death for being raped. Um, and now up in New Hampshire, a, there's a case uh, in which a guy has pleaded guilty and the, <laughs> the victim of the sexual assault had to apologize to the church. All right. Um, 
So now this is in Concord, New Hampshire. Uh, there is a man by the name of Ernest Willis of Guilford, New Hampshire, and uh, he and this young girl were members of Trinity Baptist Church, whose pastor's name is was was um, uh, Phelps. Actually, is the last name Chuck Phelps. No relation. <laughs> No. Okay. That's my question. Is he a relation? <laughs> as far as I know. Okay. Anyway, um, and back in 1997, mm-hmm. he uh, impregnated his children's babysitter, Tina Anderson. Um, she was 15 years old at the time. He says that the sex was consensual, but acknowledges that the girl was under the legal age of consent which then makes it a statutory rape. Right. But then um, with uh, the, it, it turns out that it was not consensual. Um, he threatened violence to her. He, he also um, offered to, yeah, offered to use violence on this child to conceal the crime. He offered to punch her so that she would miscarry. Nice right. guy. Um, now I was, I was really curious about this because yeah, this, this whole idea of that this girl, you know, got pregnant and then, um, she had to apologize to her church for getting pregnant out of wedlock. And then they, the, the pastor basically, um, offered to, to send her somewhere else to hide until the baby was born and she could give the child up for adoption. And like, they're trying to cover Colorado. the whole thing up. Yeah. And, um, yeah, nice and far away. And, and in fact, because of that, the, this case has dragged out so long because they couldn't find her to testify. Um, now, I went to the church's website, and the pastor has a blog there, and apparently appeared on, I don't watch 2020, but apparently they were on 2020 um, talking about this. And uh, it's interesting to read um, his blog. Uh and this is not the same pastor, so he's you know he's trying to sort of defend his church, you know, and, and of course the press never deals well, especially with conservative um, Christian churches. Um, so here's the deal: the church has apologized for what happened in the past, all right, and and said you know we we firmly believe that uh, that criminals should be prosecuted and victims should be um, should be comforted and. Um, and, and taken care of. And, you know, so this is something that happened in the past. It's not, um, something that anybody should sort of judge the church now. They have, um, you know, it's right in his blog. He, he talks about, um, that this, you know, basically shouldn't have happened. They're sorry that it happened. Um, you know, it's, it's not, he can't control the actions of an, of a previous pastor at that church. So, um, and, and but he, is the church doing anything to reach out to her to make up for what happened? Um, they said they've, they've tried to contact her. Um, it kind of sounds like she's really just wants to sort of get on with her life and um, you know kind of be done with it. Um, they do, however, have in place uh, very specific security policies now, um, where any uh, they they track. All of their members on the, um, as far as anybody on the sex offender registry, and um, and any time, any of, and I, apparently they do have a couple members that are on the registry. They track them as far as uh, if they if those people attend um, any events, that they have security people that sort of keep an eye on them at the events. So um, so they are doing something to at least as much as they can do, you know, as a church to see to it that it doesn't happen again. Mm -hmm. Um, This did, you know, sort of raise something for me. I got a email from, because I'm signed up with the, um, the registry to get notification of any changes um, in, you know, radius around here. And, and I just got an email like yesterday about a, a change. I think it was somebody that just sort of moved into the area or something like that. And, 
We've got, you know, within a, a mile radius or so, we've got a few that are in the registry. And um, so, you know, I, I thought about this and do you, uh, when, it, when it comes to doing outreach, you know, and, and we, when somebody new moves into the area, they get a, a note from us um, and, and a welcome, you know. And, uh, and, and, and oftentimes and our society, uh, treats this as sort of unforgivable sin. And, um, and, and certainly it's, it's, it's a horrible, horrible thing, uh, no matter what level you're talking about. Um, but at the same time, boy, if anybody needs to know the love and forgiveness of Christ, um, if, if that person is, is repentant of, of what they've done to know that, that there is forgiveness available to them. Um, you know, it's, it's important that they know that. And so, so then the question is, how do you sort of reach out to them? It's not like you want to say, well, we saw your name on the sex offender registry. So we wanted to drop you a note and tell you God loves you, you know, because then they can be like, oh man, (laughs) you know, um, you know, at the same time, if, you know, with the sort of new mover thing, whatever, if you, if you find out that, you know, somebody who's attended your congregation or, or something, they're on the registry. What do you do? Um, how do you handle that? And, you know, it's, it's kind of tricky because you, you don't want to be known as, well, that's the church that reaches out to sex offenders. <laughs> you can kiss your family ministry goodbye, you know. Um, you're not going to get a lot of youth attending there. <laughs> Probably not a lot of women either. Um, but, you know, at, at the same time, there's got to be a way to, to, share the gospel um, with people who are really because of something they've done are just instantly marginalized in our community. So it's a tricky thing. In fact, I, any, I'm sorry, go ahead. You say something. No, no, it's, uh, you know, it's, yeah, they're, 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 this is, this is, this is just evil. Once again, you know, I keep reminding the memory the passage in Romans where God says, My name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Yeah, and here it is again. You know, this guy uh uh, uh abuses her, covers up the the, 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 the the pastor please cover up. You know, I mean by saying, Hey, let's uh yeah, you know, here I'll I'll ship you to Colorado. You can have the kid put up for adoption. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, by the way, let me apologize for this in front of everybody. And then the jerk pastor um, is claiming um, uh, privileged counsel, so oh, he yeah. can't be forced to testify about this. Um, but the um, even though there was a uh, lawyer present, yeah, the guy, yeah, the, the, yeah, he says, yeah, the guy had a lawyer present. Um, you know. Well, why? Because he's you know really knew he was he was on thin thin ice. What he was doing here? Yeah. Uh, Suddenly, so the seal of the, of the confessional has already been broken. Yeah. Well, I tell you, this guy, you know, guys like that does just deserve to be, you know. You know, I'm glad God forgives people because personally, at the times I feel like hell couldn't be deep enough for some of these people. So. That's, uh, I don't know if you ever feel that way, but I often do. Yeah, I, you know, I, I struggle with that. I'll tell you as a, um, just a, as a foster parent, um, that when I, some of the, the things that I hear about, you know, happening to kids, um, just the, the stories that we heard in our classes, some of the things that I, you know, personally heard and, and stuff, you just kind of go, what do you, how can you, uh, um, and, and, uh, you know, sometimes it's just somebody did something stupid where they just sort of weren't thinking or, or, you know, and you, and it was sort of like, that was just the, the most idiotic thing that I've ever heard of somebody doing. And, and, and how could you possibly do that? And some of these cases of neglect and stuff like that. Um, and then the person is just, you know, sort of comes to their senses and, and goes, what was I, what was I thinking? You know, and, and they feel horrible about it and they, um, 
you know, they face the, the earthly consequences and, um, you know, and there've been times where I've, I've been there to, to pronounce forgiveness for things like that. Um, and there's, you know, there's other times where people do things they, they're, they're not sorry for it. They try to cover it up the, you know, and, you know, I'm and, and thinking about this pastor, um, this pastor Phelps, you know, what, uh, the fact that, that he's trying to kind of cover things up. I mean, I know as a pastor that it, it's tempting to try to cover up your sin because you're supposed to be a role model and all that kind of stuff. And what happens when your when your witness falls apart? Um, boy, at the same time, the truth, you know, you, it's not going to be to your advantage if you cover it up because the truth's going to come out eventually. And, uh, you know, it's, it's gonna, you're just going to look that much worse. What well, the proverb says, those who cover up their sin will not prosper. Yep. And that's the way it goes. And you try to cover it up, but it doesn't work. Hey, well, let's see here. Um, Harold Camping was wrong. We didn't, the rapture didn't come. Jesus didn't return. But you know what? It shouldn't be expected because heaven doesn't exist anyway. Yeah, according to uh, Stephen Hawking, you know, leading theologian Stephen Hawking. Oh, wait, no. Theoretical physicist Stephen Hawking. Really, really smart guy. Uh, but I'm a little curious where in his studies uh, he's come up with uh, um, the evidence that heaven doesn't exist. Well, remember what Paul says in Romans, thinking they have become wise, they have become fools. But anyway, Stephen Hawking overall is no fool. He's a very brilliant theoretical phys- physicist and has been for years. Also a great Star Trek fan, by the way. Um, but uh, he um, said um, uh, that, um, I have lived with the prospect of an early death for the last 49 years. I, I, he's 69 years old. At this point, it's no longer an early death. Uh, I'm not afraid of death, but I'm in no hurry to die. I have so much to do first. I regard the brain and its computer, which will stop working when its components fail. There is no heaven or afterlife for broken down computers. That is a fairy story for people afraid of the dark. I'm, I'm just trying to figure out where he comes from with these comments. It's like oh, an earlier he had early said in a different assertion that the universe was not created by God. Mm-hmm. So all you got to do is ask him, okay, so what caused the singularity? No. You know what co- what caused the Big Bang? You can trace all the way back to the, to there, and then you have to stop. Yep. Um, well, it, it just did. I mean, you know, he he he, you know. He's an atheistic evolutionist. It just is. It happened. Right. End of story. Yeah. The problem you know. is he, he believes in a perpetual motion machine, right? Because the idea is that, that what caused it? Well, it was, it was compression. And so, you know, the, that the universe is sort of doing this, you know, in and out, that it explodes right. and then it comes back together and explodes, comes back together. That's perpetual motion and it's physically impossible. As a physicist, he should know that. Well, I'm not going to argue physics with him, and, and you're, but you're more than welcome to do so. Um, but, um, you know, I read this kind of guy, and I've always come back to Pascal's equation, or Pascal's wager, you know, that if you believe in God, it makes your life better. If you don't believe in God, you know, it makes your life better. And if you're wrong, so what? It makes your life better. But if you say God doesn't exist and you're wrong, you've got a problem. Uh, and I look at this. Okay, there's no hell. There's no, there's no afterlife. That's just for people afraid of the dark. And I would say, okay, if you're right, so what? I die, I die. In the meantime, my hope of heaven really has been a very positive thing in my life. You know, it really affects how I live right now. It gives me hope when people die. It gives me hope that when my parents died, 
It gives me, it, it affects my life in so many tremendous ways. It really does. That even when things are bad, I remember Paul's words that, you know, our, um, that, uh, uh, our, our, our troubles now are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. I find that so comforting. I really do. So you but would argue that bright, you're afraid of the dark. You know, if, you know, I hate death. I hate it, hate, hate it immensely. I'll say, okay, fine. You know what? Maybe I am afraid of the dark, but I'm going to go in the dark eventually. I, you know, I know that. You know, we all do. And yeah, I'm going to close my eyes. I'm going to die. Okay, that's life. And if you're right, then I die. But for now, I have hope. On the other hand, if the Christians are right and you're wrong, Oh, do you've got a problem? Mm-hmm. I mean, at the end of it, yeah, I, I'm. Afraid, I might be afraid of the dark, but I'm going to be there eventually. You know, it's not going to really hurt me going into it afraid. Yeah, but man, and I don't know. I don't know. Have you ever been at the the bedside of William Members when they passed away, and they've opened their eyes and they've had that look past you? Mm-hmm. Have you ever thought that they had this glimpse of heaven? No, you know, it's not just that. You talk to hospice workers, and they talk about how they um, write, like they can tell when they're nearing death, because it's like a universal thing that people see, people that have gone before, you know? And I, I'm, you know, and I kind of wonder about the details of that, but, um, and, I, and I've got some unanswered questions about that particular phenomenon, but... Um, you know, the thing is that not only have I seen that, um, you know, I've seen miraculous things happen that you can't explain. Um, I, uh, I, I've had, well, I'll mention this personal experience. I, I mentioned it in church, so it's public knowledge. Um, I don't think I've mentioned it on the show before, but a few weeks ago, uh, I was praying for one of our members that was, uh, she had cancer and um and it was this i can only describe it as a voice right um and and voice isn't quite the right word for it it was almost just like this sort of idea that would that all of a sudden appeared in my mind and it was um and said pray that she be healed and i went yeah thy will be done you know um if it be your will and it was like no pray that she be healed and I went, um, okay, well, God, you know, if you heal her, that would really, you know, bring you glory. She could continue to, to serve you and glorify you and, you know, and, and, and that would be a really great thing. So please heal her. And, uh, and then I, I sort of didn't really think anything else of it until Sunday when, um, she comes up to me in church and says, pastor, I just got the, um, results back a couple of days ago. Um, from some tests on my cancer and it's gone. Uh, and I went, wait a minute. <laughs> Cause I just kind of forgotten about that, um, that event. And I, I thinking back, I'm not sure how you forget about something like that, but it was just sort of, it, you know, it was just sort of, I went on with my day and, and, but then it was like, it just came flooding back to me and I went, Oh, whoa. <laughs> you know, here, this, this woman was miraculously healed and God told me he was going to do it. You know, I mean, I, what, what do you do with that? <laughs> You're going to say, well, that was just some weird coincidence or something like that. You know, I mean, and then you get into, we were this morning in, in Bible class, we were talking about the prophecies in the Old Testament, that there's like, what, 300 prophecies or something like that fulfilled in Christ and, and that, the the chances that just the the statistical chances of all of those prophecies being fulfilled um are i mean the the number is just astronomical just i mean crazy astronomical and you can chalk it up to coincidence until you realize yeah you know, these guys were all very certain that this was going to happen you know here's your this your you know the difference between a true prof- prophet and a guy like Harold Camping okay who by the way I don't think he claims to be a prophet he's just thinks that he's got a insight into reading scripture, all right? But a true prophet, 
nails it 100% every time. Okay? And the prophets in the Bible nailed it 100% every time. And most of them, most of those prophecies are about Jesus. So, but, you know, here's the thing. We can argue this stuff till we're blue in the face. You know, I can tell you about my experience. I can tell you um, about, you know, what the this the statistics and, and all of that kind of stuff. I can talk about physics. I can talk about any number of things. Okay. But what it comes down to is, like Jesus said, they have Moses and the prophets. Listen to them. Um, and, you know, otherwise, even if the dead are raised, they still won't believe. All right. And, in fact, Jesus rose from the dead. And the chief priests that had him killed, they still didn't believe. Right? They paid off the soldiers to shut him up. You know, so, you know, the, the you can't argue faith with somebody. And I and and while I agree with Pascal's wager, at the same time, I'm not sure that um, just in case is really faith. Um, but it's it's a, at least a sort of argument to 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 consider. Well. Hmm, maybe I should at least, you know, take a look at this. Um, I, I appreciated the, the last line of this article. It said, Hawking is happy to discuss M-theory, in which the universe is said to have 11 dimensions. Why then could the universe not have a 12th spiritual dimension? If there's a bright center to the universe, you're on the planet that is farthest from. And, um, I, I think the spiritual dimension is completely different from uh, anything that the laws of physics could cover. But at the same time, you know... It, Anybody that, that, especially somebody who's into, who's a theoretical physicist, to to look at the, the the just bizarre complexity of the universe. I mean, beyond our ability, stuff that we can only theorize about because we can't observe it. All right, the math works out, and that's what they're going based on. And the, but they can't prove it. All right, he's willing to accept that, but he's not. You know. Even he's not willing to accept the possibility of a God, of a heaven, of an afterlife. Right? I'm sorry, but that's not good science. <laughs> so, science acknowledges possibilities. So, I, I if anything, to me, it sounds like he's afraid of hell. Down. Um. And the only way to avoid it is to pretend it doesn't exist. Unfortunately, that doesn't work. So I, I just you know, pray for Stephen Hawking. You know, like Jim mentioned, he's sort of getting up in his years, and um, and with somebody who already has this horrible disease, man, that guy needs to know Jesus. We will find out. We will find out. Or maybe if he doesn't want to, I don't know. Yeah, by the way, he, you know, he can know Jesus and not join a church. There you go. So, I don't know. I'm trying to come up with these connections, folks. I'm trying to do the segues tonight. Don't know if they always work. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, yeah, this is something that uh, uh, I'd actually, that's nothing new. No. Um, uh, this, the, but uh, this is from uh, the Christian century. Um. And um, it's talking about uh, just how many um, uh, it's, 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 uh, uh, um, I, I just about the number of people, particularly in their twenties and thirties, who attend church but don't join. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really common. You know, the whole sort of church membership thing. It's really kind of a well. It's 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 a it's popular among baby boomers, but um, it's it's really sort of a thing of the past, uh, or it's 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 on its way out, um, and and we as churches really need to be aware of that, all right, that we don't get hung up on people becoming members. Well, I actually started going out with the baby boomers. It was really the, the World War II and Korean War generation, what they often call the builders, the ones who built a lot of institutions that were really big on that kind of stuff. Um, you know, we're not, we've got, we tend to have a lot more people, you know, younger groups have always been much more on a different, uh, just more about, uh, uh, you know, attending, not necessarily joining. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. And so this is, you know, just as you think about your, um, your evangelism, your assimilation processes, things like that, you know, here, here's the thing. And this is something that this actually goes back to something that I said, um, when, when the church that I'm at, Shepherd of the Ridge, when they, um, before they called me as their pastor, uh, they did a phone interview and, um, and one of the things I told him, which I had had a couple other interviews uh, before that, and um, I just all of a sudden my name was out there all over the place, and um, and I was getting contacted by a lot of churches. And um, one of the things that um, that I told them that I had said to a couple other churches that didn't call me was, "You need to understand something about me. I'm not about I, I'm not a, about advertising um, for a particular congregation." I'm about connecting people with Jesus, right? And so I'm, you know, if, if, if I'm able to, to talk to somebody and share the gospel with them and, and they go to church somewhere else, fine, great, right? And, um, and, and so, you know, as a church, any church that I'm going to be at needs to be about connecting people with Jesus, not boosting, you know, church membership. And, um, and and they said that well, after they called me, I asked them, you know, what was it that, what was the um, the biggest reason that they that out of the various people that they talked to that I was the one that they called? And they said it was because of that, and I, that was really encouraging to me. And it was one of the reasons that I accepted the call here, um, because okay, then you get it. So now, I mean, you know, there's advantages to people actually being members. Um, you know, for one, it's a, it's a lot easier to sort of keep track of people. Um, and, and it, it gives you an excuse to call them up and say, um, you know, Hey, haven't seen you in a while. How you doing? Is everything okay? Is there something I can do for you? But at the same time, as long as you sort of dismiss the membership model, you can still do that. You know, if you have people that have attended your church and, and have given you their contact information. You can still call them up and and say, "Hey, how you doing? Um, you know, is everything okay? Is there anything we can do for you?" And uh, and you can still invite them to, you know, to events. You can invite them to get involved in, um, you know, small group Bible studies or whatever it is that you're doing as a church. Um, you know, and uh, if if anything, it, it's sort of freeing because you're not just contacting members. Mm-hmm. So I, well, um, I have on our, on our little pew pads that people fill out, there's a little checkbox for I'm on Facebook. And if somebody visits our church and checks that checkbox, I send them a friend invite. Um, you know, it's a way to, to connect with people. And, and, and I'm surprised how many people, um, are, will accept those requests. Is this any way to treat an intimate friend? And, That's just because you're such a nice guy. <laughs> It's because they don't, anyway. haven't gotten to know me well enough yet. <laughs> well, that's true too, but that's another story. Um, but uh, they 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 talked to uh, two Lutheran pastors in here. Both, I guess, are ELCA. Uh, one by a guy by the name of Craig Mueller at Holy Trinity Lutheran Church in um, in Chicago. And he says, you know, he can look over the church and see several dozen young people he doesn't know. Um, and who are unlikely to pursue a relationship with church. They do not stay for social hour. They do not stay in small groups or Bible studies. Now, are these people who just simply are visiting? Or are these people who attend regularly? I think it's interesting. It says, you know, I mean, I, 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 I don't know. I mean, these people who, who attend regularly or, or, or what. But he says, you know, he wants to have a no strings attached welcome. Well, I think all of us try to do that. Um, but then, then there's a, another one. Here's a guy by the name of Peter Marty, who's in Iowa, and he says, uh, you know, did you create a community of common people gathered for a holy purpose? Um, and when you become a member, you discover the privilege of being a giver as well as, as, well as a taker. Um, I can't take it anymore! And, you know, I, I would encourage people to join, but there are some people who aren't quite sure, you know, really what they're looking for. And... Uh, 
obviously, you know, but I think we as, 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 as pastors need to be able to define success in ministry otherwise by, um, uh, 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 people in the pews and dollars in the offering plate. To some you know, degree. It's really about how have we, what? To some degree. You know, how can we, um, you know, talk about making connections really with Jesus? Um, one of the, the, the one, this guy, uh, Craig Mueller says, uh, you know, um, so I, somebody wants to be part of a committee, I can measure that. But somebody else just lives their faith daily in a very deep way. How do I, um, you know, how do I, you know, measure that? Um, the sociologist here says, um, churches need to put a new emphasis on touching people's lives instead of ga- gaining new members. These are two different enterprises. Uh, institutions want to count people. They want to report growth, but they may not be able to do that the way they once did. The assessment of vitality may have to take a different form. And I, and I agree with that. You know, growth in a church, I believe, is never a goal, can never be the goal. Touching people's lives, um, sharing Christ with people, Seeking to touch people who are not in your church, that has to be the goal. Growth is a byproduct of that. Mm-hmm, growth right. never, can never be the goal. But, um, you know, when we talk about growth, though, you also have to talk about growth, um, you know, individual growth. You know, I mean, and, and this is something I've been thinking a lot about lately, is that we've got a lot of people that have been, that are lifelong members, and, um, and I'm not saying like our church in particular, but churches in general. You have people that have been members for, you know, years, charter member of the congregation or, you know, um, been a member here all my life or, you know, 80 years and, you know, whatever. Okay. And they'd never been to a small group Bible study. They don't talk about their faith. You know, they're, they're uncomfortable. It's like they're, the, the, they don't spend time on a regular basis, um, reading the Bible, uh, praying, you know, like they show up for an hour on Sunday morning and that's the sum total of their faith. And, um, or, you know, unless things get really bad, (laughs) um, or, uh, or, or maybe they, they sort of will, will back the, uh, the evangelical candidate or something like that. But, um, you know, it's no matter how old you are, all right, St. Paul talks about um, milk versus meat. Um, and, you know, just about every church out there has people who are, you know, regardless of age, are still nursing. All right? And they haven't actually gotten into the meat. They haven't, you know, been dug into God's Word and, and study it with other Christians and, and um, you know, gotten insights from each other and, and sort of built that community around God's word. And the thing is, you look at, at the, the Bible's description of the church, faith doesn't exist in a vacuum. You know, the, there is no, the, the sort of individual faith. Now you can't believe for somebody else. Okay. You, that, that doesn't work. But, but at the same time, um, in throughout the Bible, the, the faith is something that's shared. All right. It's, it's something, it's, it's community and, and, um, and when you're, if, if, if you're, if, if you're coming just to, you know, to sort of do your weekly duty, um, you're really missing the point. And, and I, you know, that, that's something that really concerns me. And, and, and I, and I know lots of pastors that go, well, my people grow every week because they, you know, they hear my sermon or whatever. And, um, but I mean, are they really growing or are they just maintaining? Um, you know, and, and so, and, and of course with any given person, you can't, you know, you can't judge. Okay. Um, you could have people, you don't know what necessarily what they're doing in their, um, in their personal lives. Okay. Um, but at the same time, you can talk to them and ask them, you're their pastor, you know? So, so say, are you, you know, are you involved in something? And, and if not, why not? What's, what's keeping you away? You know, is there something that, that we can offer? Are you looking for, uh, you know, uh, for some particular thing? Are you just not looking? And if not, why not? And, and to tell people, you know what, being a Christian 
you're you're really missing out on on what it means to be a disciple if you're not actually seeking opportunities to be in God's word besides an hour a week and and sharing that and and stuff and and just sort of like what's going on that you're not mhm so um you know that some pastors really think about that um people if you know if you're um <laughs> You you can't all right if you're attending church and and your other spiritual discipline is watching CrossFit every week, <laughs> that's not good enough. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I don't know how much better you could ask than that. <laughs> I just I I just don't know how much better you could ask than that. So and, I mean you know it's important. It's not like you you, you have to sort of. Um, that there's a checklist and you do all those things, you're a good Christian. All right. Um, you know, it, if anything, it's, it's just going to make you more aware of your sin, um, and your need for, for forgiveness. And, um, you know, but so it, it, it's, you gotta be careful, you know, when you, when you talk about that kind of thing, but, you know, just think about it. There's just because you're attending every week or, or, you know, fairly regularly doesn't mean you're actually growing. So, you know, think about it. Talk about it. Talk about it with the other people from your church. Talk about it with your Christian friends. Talk about it with your pastor. You know, if you're a pastor, talk about it with your people. Talk about it with your church leadership, you know. Uh, what does that mean? So, okay. Those Out are all pulpit. good questions. <laughs> all right. So, uh, any other comments, questions people have about this? Any thoughts you might have about it? You can always let us know at crossfeed at, at podcast at crossfeednews.com uh, we can also find out cool things if you want to make comments on YouTube if you're watching it there um, we'll always enjoy and appreciate your comments do we have any comments this, this week I can't remember I don't think so um, I I just got you know the episode posted a couple days ago it's been a pretty busy week so um, so I, I don't think so I'll double check for next week in case we missed anybody though um, if we did, it would have been a YouTube comment, but I don't think we did. So, oh, um, okay. uh, but if you've been raptured, don't bother commenting. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Some people, I tell you. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, we, on that note, we're just going to say goodbye for the day, folks. I'll tell you, you know. Yeah. Um, By the way, we're coming up on, this is like episode, what, 198, something like that. We're coming up on 200. Number 200. So we have to have to come up with something, some way to celebrate number 200. Uh, it's a pretty big milestone. So um, if anybody has any ideas, let us know. I th one thing I thought about was uh, uh, live streaming. I think I figured out how to how we could do it. Where we could have people sort of, you know, listen or watch live and um, and and be able to kind of chime in and comment during the episode and, and stuff like that. Um, but it it would be a little bit of a hassle to set up. I could do it. Um, I've got the setup. I, I have everything I need to be able to do it. I just take a little bit of work to kind of figure out the details of it. Um, if people are interested in that, drop us a line and let us know. Uh, we record this on. Uh, sunny nights uh, about uh, what nine o'clock Eastern? Yeah, um, yeah, roughly. So if you know if you'd be available at that time, and and that's something that that you'd be interested in um, in checking in on, and that uh, drops a note, drops an email, or um, and and let us know because um, I'm not gonna go through all the hassle of setup if not a single person's gonna take advantage of it. So. Uh, otherwise, we'll come up with something else instead. Yeah, so, yeah. Jim's losing his audio too, so it's good timing that we're <laughs> wrapping things up. So, uh, thanks everybody for tuning in, and good night, and God bless. Mm -hmm.